A mom ate a suspicious chicken burrito from a shady restaurant. This is what happened to her digestive system. DC is a 42-year-old woman presenting to the emergency room with abdominal pain and a massive headache. She tells the admitting nurse that over the last several weeks, she could barely eat bread, rice, and fish oil capsules, but they were the only things she could keep in her stomach. Four months earlier, DC got a chicken burrito from a new place that had opened up. She was running late for a meeting, so she was eating in her car. The burrito was delicious, and she took a big bite at a stop sign. But as she chewed, something suddenly cracked against a tooth in the back of her mouth. It didn't hurt, but it startled her. She spat out the food and thought that she could feel part of a tooth had chipped off. She wasn't sure how extensive this damage was, but she was panicked. She started digging through the food, frantically trying to find what did this, and then she came across it. A chicken bone piece embedded in the shredded thigh meat from the burrito. But she couldn't find the part of her tooth that had chipped off. It didn't seem like a lot of damage. It didn't hurt. If she went back to the restaurant to accuse them that their food had chipped her tooth, what were they going to do? Thoughts started racing through her mind. She knew that she had to get back to work. The restaurant could just say that she made it up, that she was the one that put the bone there. She didn't want to be confrontational, and because it didn't hurt, it didn't seem like a big deal. She drove back to the office to attend her meeting. DC would notice her tooth, but only when she wanted to, and eventually she forgot about it. It didn't hurt. But one day, weeks later, she was sitting at her desk and she thought she could feel her heart beating in her gums. Looking in the mirror, she thought like her face was getting swollen. Sometimes, when she'd have a cold drink, that one particular tooth would be ultra sensitive and really start to hurt with the pain radiating through her jaw. At the dentist, they found that DC's chipped tooth was infected. Good thing this was caught in time, because bacteria inappropriately growing inside can spill into the blood and start to cause massive problems. The operation turned out fine. She'd have to deal with some post-operative pain, so they wrote her a prescription for it. And because bacteria was involved, they gave her another prescription for antibiotics. And she was on her way. But one of these was going to turn DC's life upside down. Bacteria has the potential to grow uncontrollably, causing infections, so this was the kind of medicine that she needed at this particular point in time, but something was wrong. Two days after taking the antibiotic by mouth every six hours, DC didn't feel right. Normally she'd take mid-afternoon naps, but when she woke up from this one, she experienced a mental fog that she had never felt before, but even worse, a sense of doom shrouded over her. She had had some experience with feeling down throughout her life, but she started having some truly terrible thoughts and feelings that she just couldn't shake. At first, she thought it was the pain medicine, but she stopped the antibiotics early too. She started feeling a little better as time passed, but clearly something had changed in her body and she wasn't sure how to feel like she did before the tooth operation. Antibiotics need to be finished in their entirety. If the directions on the bottle says five days, you should take it for those five days because if not, the bacteria can grow back and the bacteria that grows back can be resistant to that antibiotic because those were the survivors who might have had traits that helped them adapt and survive that antibiotic. DC knew this, but the dark and terrible thoughts were simply too much for her to handle, and her tooth and her gums were healing just fine, she thought. This brings us back to the idea of bacteria growing uncontrollably causing infection. That's one part of the equation. You see, humans coexist with bacteria. In the lining of our gut are trillions of microbes helping us digest food and live our normal lives. They're normal. They're supposed to be there. They create their own community called the gut microbiome. If antibiotics are given when someone has an infection, which is defined as an inappropriate growth of bacteria, then it lends way to the connotation that all bacteria are bad, and that we must get rid of all of them to be in the cleanest condition possible, because that's disease-free. But that line of thinking isn't fully correct. The gut microbiome is essential for normal function. But what does that mean? Well, these trillions of bacteria help do a variety of things, like synthesize vitamins. They metabolize bile, which helps us digest fat and metabolize hormones. Because the microbiome is like a living ecosystem, it can competitively exclude other pathogens trying to come in and take residence in the gut, protecting their host. And more recently, we're starting to understand how extensive a role it plays in helping immunity. For example, 
Traditional chemotherapy use for some malignancies have gone by the wayside since the mid-2010s in favor of immunotherapy, medicines that enable the immune system to recognize and attack the tumor. We found that the presence of certain bacteria in the gut microbiome makes those therapies more effective against the tumors. This strongly suggests that there's a link between the gut microbiome and the immune system, showing just how important this entity is. But if DC is getting antibiotics that are intended to eliminate bacteria from her tooth infection, then it means that some of the bacteria from her gut is going to be incidentally eliminated in the process. That's a trade-off that we need to account for because the bacteria from that tooth infection could spread throughout her body, putting her in the hospital, and could threaten her life, while the bacteria in her stomach should grow back, but how long would that take? And when that bacteria do grow back, how will we know that the right species are going to be there? Shortly after all of this, on a Monday afternoon, DC had a watery stool. She thought maybe it was the yogurt that she ate in the morning for breakfast, but throughout that afternoon, she kept going to the bathroom. Each time the movement out was more intense than the one before, and every time she thought she was done, she could feel that there was going to be more on the way. But everything was inconsistent. The next day on Tuesday, she was fine, but on Wednesday, she woke up with what she thought was a fever, and she felt like her entire digestive system was getting ejected into the toilet. Standing up, she felt like her organs were getting dragged out of her body and into the ground. She couldn't even keep down water. She'd take a sip and liquid stool would just gush out her other end. And as she kept getting more and more dehydrated, her head started pounding. It hurt so bad, she couldn't even swallow headache medicine without having a watery stool. Unable to take this, she drives herself to the emergency room. In the hospital, the medical team gave DC fluids and medicines for her headache. Knowing about how her bowel movements have been over the last several days and that she has a fever, it's possible that she has infectious diarrhea. They do a quick test and they find that she doesn't appear to have a stomach bug, but she still has a fever. So they give her some empiric antibiotics just in case and some medicine for her headache. And after a few days, she's discharged from the hospital feeling okay, but that would only be for a short time. About a week after that hospital stay, DC started having watery stools again, but this time something was different. The smell was something that she had never experienced before. It was one of the most awful sensations in her life up to that point, and she didn't want to believe that it was being produced by her. At first, she thought that something was weird about that yogurt that she ate for breakfast again. She looked at the date and found out that it was expired, but this time the stools were really out of control. She was in the bathroom every hour for days, eating only rice and bread, if she could even keep those down. Back in the emergency room, again. The medical team take a sample of her stool to test, and when the results return, it tells them everything that they need to know about what's happening. Do you remember the gut microbiome? Well, when DC got antibiotics for her tooth infection, the one that she got is known to be a culprit for infectious diarrhea. But when she was in the emergency room the first time, they took a sample of her stool to test, and it said that she didn't have infectious diarrhea. That might have been true at that point in time, but at that hospital stay, they gave her a second, different antibiotic empirically, since she had a fever and those multiple bowel movements. Do you remember those dark thoughts that DC had after she started taking the first course of antibiotics? Well. It's hard to say for sure exactly what happened, but there's research that shows links between the gut microbiome and some psychiatric problems. You see, the gut and the brain are connected by the vagus nerve, and this bidirectional connection means that one will have an impact on the other, which will come back and impact the one. If DC started having symptoms possibly related to mental health after the first antibiotic, and antibiotics are known to change gut microbiome composition by eliminating all different kinds of bacteria, then it's possible that some change was taking place back then, and it not only impacted her brain, but also her gut, judging from those uncontrolled loose stools. And given that she suddenly stopped that antibiotic and then went to the hospital afterwards to get a different antibiotic, then we could guess that even more normal gut bacteria was eliminated when they didn't need to be. But then the question is, with all those gone, what bacteria replaces those eliminated? Test results for DC return, and it tells the medical team that the bacteria Clostridioides difficile, also known as C. diff, is present in her gut. 
This is the cause of her diarrhea. This is infectious. It can spread all throughout the hospital, infecting other patients who may also be on antibiotics, but don't have this particular bacteria growing in their gut yet. As this result is read, DC was put in a private hospital room. She's not allowed to share it with anyone. The toileting facilities are dedicated to her. All medical staff have to gown up and glove up before entering her room, and they must wash their hands after dealing with her because they inevitably will have to physically deal with other patients, people, and objects in the hospital. The thing about C. diff is that it makes and releases toxins that not only cause nonstop watery stools, but also damage to the gut inner lining. They can destroy the cells of the colon, and then the immune system gets triggered to act in the area, causing colitis, itis meaning inflammation. As the days pass, DC sits in her hospital room, suffering with sporadic bowel movements every day. Her problem was first caused by her chipped tooth not getting taken care of early. It became infected, and the antibiotic that she got for that infection started to change everything. Shortly after DC received a second, different antibiotic, the recomposition of bacterial species in her gut microbiome happened, very likely leading to C. diff coming in and taking over. Ironically, the treatment for her at this time is yet another antibiotic, one that has activity against Clostridioides difficile, and in this case, taken by mouth, because the intravenous formulation of that antibiotic wouldn't have the same activity in her gut, because taking it by mouth puts it directly there. If she's dehydrated from all these watery stools and has trouble keeping even water down, then they can replace her fluids intravenously. In the hospital, days later, DC starts to feel better. This third antibiotic appears to be working for her. She's rehydrated, and her fever is gone. Several more days pass. She appears well. No more loose stools. No more fever. No more swollen abdomen, as she's discharged and sent home. And everything appears to be okay, but only for a short time. One day, a few weeks later, DC was eating some fruit with breakfast. In the afternoon, she felt a sour stomach, maybe a little heartburn. She wanted to be careful given everything that had happened recently. She tried an over-the-counter medicine that someone had recommended to her, one that would help limit stomach acid. They told her that it might take a couple of days to start working, but that in the end, she would be all good. But a couple days went by, and DC started feeling kind of weird again. One afternoon, she could feel her guts quake and shake. In the bathroom, again, she had a watery stool, and she started to panic here because that smell was so familiar to her. Throughout that day, she had multiple, uncontrollable, loose, watery stools again. In the hospital, again, DC was found to be experiencing a recurring episode of C. diff. Do you remember that concept of antibiotics producing resistant strains of bacteria? Well, it doesn't appear to happen often, but data says maybe 20% of patients with C. diff will get a recurrence. And even worse, sometimes it could be associated with that stomach acid medicine that she took. The thing about antibiotic treatment of Clostridioides difficile infection is that misuse of antibiotics were the cause in the first place. And the ones that are used to target C. diff can sometimes cause C. diff. This isn't meant to scare you about antibiotics, but rather demonstrate to you that antibiotics aren't to be taken lightly, because DC can be treated again, and weeks later, the C. diff can come back. And some patients will go through this with no good solutions, suffering every time with bouts of uncontrollably watery stools nonstop that can come and go for years. In fact, much of our current system of medication and prescriptions in the United States was created in part because of antibiotics. In 1928, penicillin was discovered, and its production was scaled up greatly for the world events of the 1940s. At least in the United States before 1950, people could buy almost any medicine that they wanted at a pharmacy and treat themselves without ever seeing any medical personnel. Knowing about DC's case with C. diff, and knowing that antibiotics could, at a minimum, do what they did to her, if not also create ultra-resistant strains of super bacteria that would evade every single treatment modality that we know of today, episodes of self-medication with antibiotics could be potentially catastrophic in more ways than what we're describing here. 
And so in 1951, the Durham-Humphrey Amendment was enacted by the United States Congress to require there be a class of prescription-only medicines that must be prescribed by a professional who has prescriptive authority, and then the medication on that prescription can be verified, vetted, and dispensed by a professional who has dispensing authority, serving as a check to ensure that the right patient is receiving the right medicine at the right time. It gives authority, produces accountability, and defines liability in the case that something goes wrong. Antibiotics are prescription only. The acid suppression medicine from this latest episode of hers is both over-the-counter and prescription. In DC's case, something did go wrong despite the system. One thing that could have helped is if she wasn't in a position where she was in such a rush to eat her lunch, which led to her cracking her tooth on a suspicious burrito. And one thing that absolutely saves time on food is Factor, who reached out to me and they wanted to talk about their delivery of fresh, never frozen, dietitian approved meals right to your doorstep. They offer delicious, flavor packed options on the menu every week to fit a variety of lifestyles from keto to calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and protein plus. If you're looking to mix things up, you can add a protein to select vegan and veggie meals every week. When I heard of Factor, I subscribed. I'm a regular paying customer, and I have been so happy with getting these boxes delivered every week for months now. The options are to my taste, and it's delicious. It saves me so much time reducing grocery trips, and I don't need to cook, and I don't need to clean after. And the dishes get eaten very quickly. It serves every need that I have in terms of food convenience, food variety, and being the foods that I prefer to eat in the portions that I prefer. Head to factor75.com or click the link in the description below and use code EMU50 to get 50 50% off your first factor box. I highly recommend it. In practice, you can still find pretty easily when antibiotics are given inappropriately. Like when someone has a cold or the flu, problems that aren't caused by bacteria, they're still given antibiotics when they shouldn't. I even asked this question as a quiz in my community tab, which I think you should check out. And majority who did answer got it right, but the amount who didn't, well, it can cause some issues. Suppose only 10% got it wrong. In the country with 330 million people like the United States, that's 33 million people. But for DC, her C. diff would keep coming back over several months. She would lose her mind because she'd be fine and then randomly have loose stools, and she knew it was C. diff coming back because of the smell. Her problem was initially caused by inappropriate antibiotic use. Retrying them again and again and again could work, but there might be a non-pharmacologic treatment that might help. DC was recommended for a fecal transplant, where stool from a bank makes its way into her gut with the intention of making her gut microbiome normal. DC was prepped and the medical team administered the treatment through her lower GI tract. She was then given some fecal microbiota capsules, which are FDA approved to help prevent recurrence. As she was monitored in the hospital, she was noted to not have symptoms of C. diff infection anymore. DC started to notice that her mood was better and that she was feeling better too. When she was discharged, DC wasn't sure if she was out of the woods just yet. The infection could come back. But as days turned into weeks, turned into months, DC was able to live her normal life again as she made a full recovery. Please don't be scared of antibiotics because of this video. Infections can and will be life-threatening, and things can spiral out of control in just a few hours. I'll never forget a series of patients that I saw who were young, healthy, and smiling with me in the hospital and then six hours later, they're gone because their infection went out of control. The benefit of preventing the end of a human life outweighs any risk that an antibiotic would pose in settings like that. Now, with that said, you'll want to check with all the healthcare professionals who are seeing you whether that medicine that you're going to take is the right one for you at that right time. And if you chip your tooth on food, get it checked out as quickly as you can to try to position yourself to not need what DC needed. Thanks so much for watching. Take care of yourself and be well.